Luke chapter number 12. I'm preaching tonight. The title of my message is Our Children. Our Children and Our Church Children. I'm glad we have children in our church. I preached this morning in a church and there weren't any children there. Like zero children, none. And uh, I, that, that really hit me especially because I already knew what I was going to preach tonight. And I, I thought to myself, you know, a lot of us don't realize how blessed we are. If you or yourself have children of your own, but just to have the young people in our, in our church. And I want to preach especially to young people tonight, but I want to also preach to parents and not just parents, but all the adults. So if we get all the adults and all the young people, we pretty much have it done. I'm going to pick up Luke 12 and verse 47. I'm leaving a lot out. It says, that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So here's somebody that knows the will of the Lord, but doesn't accomplish the will of the Lord. They miss the Lord's will. Maybe they don't care about the Lord's will. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Now, I believe everybody in this room, we could say that we're blessed. And God has given us much. God has given us much. And young people in this room, I want to say especially to you, God has given you much. God has given you much. And the Bible says this, to whom much is given, much shall be required. So the more that you know, the more opportunity, the more privilege you have, the more God expects out of you. God invests in you. God invests in us. And the more we have, the more we know, the more responsible we are. Psalm 127. It's great to have a lot. But let me remind you, the more you have, the more you're accountable for. I mentioned this on Thursday night. All young preachers want a big church. But the more people you have, the more you're responsible to God for and the more you're going to answer for. And we have, in this country, we have so much. And as Christians, we have so much. We have so much opportunity, so much freedom, and so much privilege. Psalm 127, verse 3, children are a heritage of the Lord. Children are a heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. His arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak uh, with the enemies in the gate. So the Bible says children are a heritage of the Lord. Children are a treasure. Now, some of you parents might have a hard time with that. All the grandparents know it's true. Children are a treasure. Children are a gift from the Lord. Children are a gift from God. Amen. And I, I appreciate our young people. We have a lot of ministering in our church to young people. It's always, always been that way. But let me say this, not only are children a treasure, young people are a treasure, but they are a trust. I'm talking about a trust like a, a responsibility, That's right. a responsibility. God doesn't give his children just to spoil them. God doesn't give his children just to uh, give them everything they want or make them soft. But God gives us children to train them to grow up, to love God, 
and to serve God. Amen. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, not the way he would go. And when he's old, he'll not uh, depart from it. So we are given children to train them for the Lord. Not, not just to enjoy them. I've enjoyed my children and my grandchildren. My, now I'm enjoying my great-grandchildren. I mean, they, I, I love my children. I love my family. I love the young people in this church and the young people coming to our school. But they're not just here for us just to love them or to spoil them. But they're here for us to train them. To train them. You're supposed to train your children. That's a responsibility parents have. And as a church, I think we can all take part in that. Look with me over in Genesis chapter number 14. Lot is in the wrong place with the wrong people. And it just grieves him, grieves him in his soul. And he gets in all kind of messes because he's not where he, you know, the worst part about being in the wrong place is not being in the right place. It isn't just wrong for people to be out in the world somewhere, but it's wrong because they're not here tonight. So here's Lot, and he gets taken, he's a hostage. Taking hostages is nothing new. And verse 14, Genesis 14, 14, when Abram heard his brother was taken captive, it's actually his nephew, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now, these are not all his own children. He doesn't have 318 of his own children here. But these are servants. And who do you think trained them? Abraham trained these servants. And we are, listen, we are supposed, we have Vision Baptist College. We're here to train young people. That's what the college is here for, to turn out pastors and Christian school teachers and uh, people that are going to work in ministry. So we need to do that. We need, we need to train some people that want to serve God and want to live for God. Amen. Um, our goal, Mrs. Clark and I, when we were raising our children, was not just to have good kids. You know, a lot of people, it's like, hope we get lucky. Well, I, I just hope they turn out all right. We didn't, we didn't, our goal was not to raise good kids. Our, our goal was to raise children that would love God and serve God. And that, that's the idea of training. And we need to be training young people. I'm going to use Solomon and David is an example in this message. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. A lot of things about Solomon and David that we could apply today in our world. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 57, David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now Jesse the Bethlehemite to Saul was just like Joe Donut Box. I mean, he was like just nobody, just one of the people out there in Israel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 22. Saul commanded his servants saying, commune with David secretly and say, behold, the king hath delight in thee and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? 
seeing I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed. So David is the son of Jesse. He's just a common man. He's, he's a poor man and he's lightly esteemed. I mean, nobody thinks anything of David. He's just, just nobody. He's just a face in the crowd. But Solomon is the son of a king. Now I'm talking about more being expected of you than just anybody else. If you're saved, you're either the son or the daughter of the king. We're God's people. We're God's children. Just let that sink in a little bit. We don't use that term a lot. We talk about the Lord as being our savior, but he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And we are his sons and we are his daughters. Look at First Chronicles. We'll be going a lot of scripture. It'll be all around here around the same place. First Chronicles chapter number, Second Chronicles chapter number one. And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. Now Solomon, listen, Solomon accomplished things that David couldn't accomplish. Solomon had a greater kingdom than David did. And rightfully so. It should have been that way. That's the way it should have been. Because Solomon had advantage. Solomon had privilege that David didn't have. So here's Solomon. And he's not just a nobody. He's royalty. And you know, when you walk in this world, and I, I mean, we're not proud people. I hope we're not proud people. But you walk around in this world and you go to work and you got all kind of lost people and there's mockers and scorners. Just remember who your father is. Just remember who your father is. What, what, what is this we see in Solomon's life? Solomon, the son of David. You know what it is? It's just grace. It's just, he's born in the family he's born in. You know, think about this. We're born in the country we're born in. And you're born in the family you're born in. And you know what that is? That's just grace. You didn't have nothing to do with that. You've been born for such a time as this. We don't, we don't pick when we're going to be born. There's certain things. It's just the grace of God. And I don't want to de-emphasize that like that's not a big thing because it is a big thing. Look in 1 Kings chapter number 2. 1 Kings chapter number 2. David gives a charge to his son. David is raising Solomon to be a man. I appreciate my wife, the mom raising the kids, but I don't believe women can teach a boy to be a man. I think it takes a man to teach a boy, to train a boy to be a man. And David here, the days of David drew nigh that he should die. He's getting old, Solomon's an adult, and he charged Solomon, his son, I'm going, to, I'm going to lay this on you. My brother is 13 years younger than me. And I remember my dad said this to me when he was, he was older when he had my brother. He said, if anything happens to me, you take care of your brother. He put that on me. And I've never forgotten that. He gave me that responsibility. Something happens to me, you take care of him. Here's David, and he's getting old, and he's talking to his son. And he said, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Don't, don't be a wimp. Be, be a man. Have a backbone. Be strong. And if you're a lady, you can be a strong lady. And I'm not talking about working out in the gym. I'm talking about having character and being spiritual. 
and keep the charge of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. David's telling Solomon how he can have a life that pleases the Lord and, and accomplish much and be successful in his life. He says that the Lord may continue his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail thee a man on the throne of Israel. Now that's a covenant blessing there that God made with David. God promised David that there would be somebody on his throne for all eternity. And we know the Lord Jesus is the son of David. Remember blind Bartimaeus? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So he's telling Solomon, listen, you do the right thing and you'll be okay. We need to train our young people. We need to train our church young people to do the right thing. So David was the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Solomon was the son of the king. Look back with me in 1 Samuel again. Chapter 16. And look at verse 11. That'd be a good verse, 1611. 1 Samuel 16, 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are here all thy children? He said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for he will not sit down. We will not sit down till he come hither. David wasn't just a nobody. He was nobody even in his own family. As far as his, his brothers were concerned, found as far as his father was concerned. No, nobody ever had a lot of uh, hope for David. Nobody ever had any big dreams for David. He was just the youngest of a big family. And here's what he was. He was a shepherd boy, a shepherd boy. Look over in chapter 17 and verse 15. David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. David's got a part-time job. He's playing a harp for Saul. He's already been anointed king and his father still treats him like he's a delivery boy. He's just an errand runner. And the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Talking about Goliath. And Jesse said to David, his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of the thousand. So here's David and he's a shepherd boy. And he's the youngest of a big family, all boys. And he's just basically a glorified delivery boy. The brothers are up there in the battle. They're getting the glory. They're getting to be in this army. And David's just taking cheese to the captain. Cheese, please. Remember back in the day, people would stand in line half a day for a five pound of cheese. I never could figure that out. Look at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 8. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, whithersoever so, whithersoever so, whithersoever so out, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest and have cut off all thy enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. How about that? That they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. 
Now the children of wickedness are still afflicting them right now, but they are in the land. They are in the place where they're going to stay. I don't know how everything's going to work out in this world with everything, some bad stuff going on, scary stuff. We ought to be praying. But I know this, God's going to keep Israel. It's the apple of his eye. He's going to preserve them. But notice what he says. I took thee from the sheep coat, from over my, uh, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And I gave thee a, a great name. Well, nobody knew David then, but everybody knows him now. And you talk, of, you talk about, you know, rags to riches. All the politicians, they like to talk about how hard they had it. Oh yeah, when I was a boy, you know, I was a girl. David, I mean, here he is. He's, he's, he's just David nobody. And he's out there keeping the sheep and he's running errands. And God says, look, I took you out of that sheep coat. I made you what you are. And I made you a ruler over Israel. And I made your name great in Israel. And it's still great in Israel today. So David was a shepherd boy. But listen, Solomon was a prince. Solomon was a prince. Solomon didn't keep sheep. Solomon didn't deliver cheese. Solomon started, listen, David started at the bottom. Solomon started at the top. Now, if you're starting at the top, you don't, don't feel bad about that. You ought to feel good about it. But you ought to be able to do more and have more and know more than people that start at the bottom because you have a big head start. If you have a Christian home, you're starting at the top. If you have a Christian family, you're starting at the top. If you went to go, go to, get to go to Christian school, you're starting at the top. If you have a Christian church, you're, you're, you're starting at the top. If you have Christian friends, you're starting at the top. You understand there's a lot of people don't have any of that. You may not have all of that. Maybe you're like David. Maybe you don't have any of that, but you are here tonight and you are in a Bible-believing church, and you are hearing the truth. And listen, it's, it's not a bad thing to have that advantage. I, I, uh, if I go back and change my life and choose some things different, I probably would. But listen, God's in control. God did the choosing for me. God did the choosing for you. God put me where I am. God put you where you are. But Solomon, to whom much is given, remember, much is required. Look in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 32. Young people, don't think that you don't have advantages with the parents you have. And don't think you don't have advantages with the church you're in. And, and even the country we live in with all the warts on it. First Samuel chapter 17. And don't think that you won't have much required of you. Because you have that responsibility. And parents and adults, we have that trust to train them and bring them up the way they should go. First Samuel chapter 17 and verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him talking about Goliath, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Thou art but a youth. He's a man of war from his youth. He's, been a, he's a trained fighter. That's all he grew up knowing. David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. I was a shepherd boy. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion 
and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. David fought battles Solomon never had to fight. David's out there keeping the sheep and a bear comes and he takes that bear and he takes that lamb out of that bear's mouth and he kills that bear. Another time a lion comes and David takes and maybe he used a slingshot. I don't know exactly how he did it, but he killed that lion. Now at that time, listen, they seemed like huge events in his life. I mean, these were, these were a big battle. These were, these, were, these were desperate things going on. But God at that time was just getting him ready for the big one. Because yeah. Goliath was going to come along, Goliath of Gath, and the whole army of Israel was not willing to fight Goliath. Right. So sometimes the biggest battles in our life, hey, listen, you ain't seen nothing yet. You don't know what's down the road. But the God that's with you now will be with you then. And the God that never leaves us nor forsakes us is never going to leave us and never going to forsake us. So David is fighting these battles. The bear, the lion, the giant. Not only that, but he has to fight the king. King Saul takes a whole army to fight David. Solomon never had to fight those fights. Can I say something, church people? A lot of you people sitting here tonight, you didn't start at the bottom. You started at the top. And there's been a lot of battles over 42 years that you didn't have to fight. Well, thank the Lord for that. There's names I could give you tonight. Don Neese, Jim Hawkins. I wrote a couple of them down. Keith Byerly, Mr. Z. That's just names of most people in here. But these are people that fought the battles so we could be where we are and enjoy what we have and have the ministry that God's given us. Proverbs 29, 18. You can turn there, you don't have to. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Churches need to have a vision. Sometimes I'll go to churches, there's no vision. There's no goal. They're not aiming at anything. You aim at nothing, you hit it every time. You need to have a vision for what God wants for you. A vision is a dream God gives you. It's not just imagination. It's not the fantasy, but something God puts on your heart. This church, before it became a reality, was a vision. But not only does the churches need a vision, not only do we need a vision, we need a vision for our young people. Amen. We need a vision to see not what could God just do with me or what can God do just with this church, but what can God do with the young people in this church? Amen. We need to have a vision. We need, we need to believe that God wants to do great things and God can use anybody. Maybe you feel like your son or your daughter is a prodigal. Maybe you feel like, well, I failed. I, I, you know, I missed it. The father, when he saw him afar off, ran and met him and hugged him and kissed him and brought him back home and restored him. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. I don't know if you ever heard Bruce Fry give his testimony. But he was out in the world for a long time. And yet, a lot of it had to do with his brother. He came to the Lord. And now he's serving God. He didn't get an early start. He got a late start. And he wastes a lot of time. But he's serving the Lord. I didn't start serving God until I was 30 years old. I wish I had started as a young person. I... I, I love to hear Brother Charlie's testimony about being saved at eight years old and called to preach it. I wish that was me, but it's not. But let me just say this. Don't give up on the prodigal. Don't give up on anybody. If you go back to when I was a boy or a young man growing up, listen, nobody in the world, nobody, including me, 
thought I would ever preach or pastor a church or serve God. I mean, that wasn't in my DNA. I mean, I, I was like the, one of the most unlikely people you would imagine. So you may look around and see some unlikely people. Hey, listen, God, other, you see, you've heard the song, other people saw a shepherd boy, God saw a king. You don't know what God can do in a person's life. I've seen people's lives turned completely around. I've seen people that were drunks and just become great Christians and great soul winners. And God can use these young people. Don't think he can. Amen. David. David never gave up on Solomon. Solomon was able to do more than David did. Look at a couple more things quickly and we'll close. First Chronicles chapter 25. First Chronicles chapter 22, I'm sorry. Verse five. David said, Solomon my, Solomon, my son is, Solomon, my son is young and tender. And the house that is to be built it for the Lord must be exceeding magnifical of fame and glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. David, listen, he knew Solomon was going to do what he couldn't do. He knew Solomon was going to do greater things than he was going to do. But he still wanted to be part of what was going on. And he made a financial investment in Solomon. Now, children, I can't imagine raising children today as expensive as everything is. But David, before he died, made a financial investment in his son. Look in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen. Who God has chosen is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. The gold for things to be made of gold, the silver for things of silver, the brass for things of brass, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, and so on and so forth. So I'm simply saying he made a financial investment in Solomon. How many people here have ever heard the word tuition? <laughs> like Christian school tuition. Every year, when it comes time for me to set the tuition for the next year, it just, it, it burdens me. It, it breaks my heart. Anybody that has a business, they charge money to make a profit. With our Christian school, we don't, we don't make a profit we lose money. You say, why would you operate something you lose money? Because most of the people in our church can't afford the tuition where it is, let alone raising it. We went a couple years, didn't raise it a dime. Not only do our parents sacrifice to have a Christian school, but our church sacrifices to have a Christian school. You say, why do you do that? Because we believe in young people. I don't have young people in the school. I haven't, I haven't had my kids in school for years and years now. And my grandchildren have graduated. And I won't be around when my great-grandchildren are here. So it's not a personal thing, but it's a God thing. Let me just say this. You kids that are here tonight, and you're in Christian school or in the college. You, you ought to just thank God. You ought to thank God for your parents. And most of you have no idea what sacrifice means. But you will learn. You will learn. So David made a financial investment in his son. And look at 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 18. O Lord God of Abraham. David is praying. I, I, there's a lot more of this prayer. I'm just not reading it for time's sake. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, 
our fathers. Keep this forever in imagination of the thoughts of the heart of the people and prepare their heart unto thee and give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, thy statutes, and to do all these things and to build the palace for the which I've made provision. What is David doing? He's praying for Solomon. He's praying for his son. He's praying. We need to make financial investment. We need, we need to train our young people. But we need to trust in God and depend on God. And we need to pray. Don't pray just for your own children. Pray for them. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray for your family. But pray for these young people in this church. There's some young people come in here and they don't have family praying for them. They don't have parents praying for them. And, and we need to pick up the slack. And, and any, any doesn't have to be your child. Doesn't have to be your son, your daughter, your grandkids. You need to pray for them. Every young person in this church that I know their name, I pray for. And some of them I just pray for so-and-so's kids because I don't even know all the names. We got so many people floating in and out here on Sunday morning. We need to pray. God help us that we pray. My, my children, I, I cannot ever remember a day that I didn't pray for them. And I'm not bragging on me. I mean, that's just what parents do. But we need to pray for the young people. Listen, this world that people are growing up in today, young people are growing up in today. It's unbelievable. I mean, the world's always been sinful. The world's always been wicked, but it's over the top. I don't know what Sodom was like. I don't know what Gomorrah was like. We, we, if we're not there, we're close. I, 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 honestly, I feel sorry for young people, teenagers growing up in this world today and everything that gets thrown at them. It's just amazing what these young people had to face. They need prayer. Let me just say this in closing. David helped Solomon, David helped his son to become great. He helped his son to be great. He was preparing him to become the king. One day, Solomon would take David's place. And one day, these young people are going to take our place. These little kids in church are going to grow up. And we're going to pass off the scene if the Lord doesn't come. And we need to, listen, we need to put something in them that they're still going to have when we're going. Amen. Jude said, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. What I got when I got saved, what I got when I was young is what I want to pass on to this next generation. 